Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Ian Gaunt, and as a council member of the London Shipping Law Centre, it's a pleasure to welcome you this afternoon on behalf of the London Shipping Law Centre to its third virtual webinar on current topics. Uh, this webinar is designed to, to tackle the subject of practical and legal issues in shipbuilding, which is a subject rather dear to my heart as I've recently been involved in co-authoring a new edition of the Law of Shipbuilding Contracts, although unfortunately the book went to press before uh, the decision in Guasin against uh, precious shipping, which is going to be the subject of quite a bit of the discussion today. Uh, but in another capacity as one of the arbitrators in that case, I'm rather relieved to find that the judge upheld the award of the arbitrators on the point on, on appeal in the case. Uh, may I introduce Sir Richard Aikens to chair the webinar today. Sir Richard is, of course, a distinguished judge, until recently a member of the Court of Appeal, and now an equally distinguished arbitrator. Uh, before taking to the bench, Sir Richard was a leading member of the commercial bar, and counsel in many important shipbuilding and commercial cases. He is now, in addition to arbitrating, a visiting professor at King's College and at Queen Mary uh, College, University of London. So without further ado, may I hand over to Sir Richard. Thank you very much indeed, Ian. Good evening to all and welcome to this webinar. Of course, despite the coronavirus pandemic, the fact remains that over 90% of the world's trade is uh, taken to its destinations from its point of origin in ships. And there is always a need for new ships, and therefore there is always a need for shipbuilding. People want more efficient ships, they want cleaner ships. And so the job of providing those goes on. But inevitably, in times like the present, problems arise. Possible delays, possible defaults, possible problems, possible breaches of warranties, and so on and so forth. And that's why we are looking at these practical and legal issues in shipbuilding uh, and having a particular focus on the SAJ form in today's world, which is a different world from what it was even only three months ago. So that's why we're having this seminar, and we are very lucky uh, to have three people who are experts in this area to speak this evening. First of all, there's going to be a joint presentation by Andrew Dinsmore of 20 Essex and Alex Hookaway of Wickborg Rhine. Andrew uh, has, of course, very uh, recent and important experience in the uh, cases, uh, the Yangtze case uh, and the, uh, the um, otherwise known as the precious shipping case uh, and uh, other cases uh, concerned with shipbuilding. Uh, he practices not only in uh, the world of shipbuilding disputes, but extensively in other commercial and international uh, disputes uh, in litigation and in arbitration. Uh, and he also has perhaps the slightly rare distinction of having full rights of audience to appear before the AIFC court in the Republic of Kazakhstan. I've had the good fortune of uh, co-authoring with Andrew uh, articles uh, on issues concerning jurisdiction and also uh, the consequences of breach of the GDPR. Turning to Alex, Alex is a senior lawyer at Whitborg Rhine's London office and is part of the firm's shipbuilding offshore practice. Before that, he worked and lived for three years in Singapore. He does work in traditional dry and wet shipping and also has um, live casualty attendance experience, experience in crisis management, and more latterly, involving disputes concerning specialist offshore construction and services 
vessels. So uh, the two of them, as you can see, have got a wealth of experience in this area. And they're going to talk to us now about the legal issues which arrive under the SHA form when there are defects in a series of vessel, vessels and also allied legal issues, uh, particularly as a result of the current uh, COVID-19 crisis, uh, focusing on things such as delays, defaults, and uh, possible uh, other issues which arise as a result of the pandemic. So uh, I think Andrew and Alex, it's over to you. Oh, before I do that, there's one further thing I should mention. Uh, those who are watching and listening, if you want to ask a question, and we do encourage questions, please just uh, put them into the Q and A box, which you can see at the bottom of your screen on the right hand side, and then I will pick them up and we can take it from there. Okay, Andrew, Alex, over to you. Thank you, Sir Richard. Uh, so let us begin with a th theoretical fact scenario, which will set the scene for the legal issues that we are going to discuss this evening. Buyers order for materially identical vessels from the same shipyard on an unamended SAJ form. The first vessel passes the sea trial. Buyers accept delivery and pay the final instalment. During the first year in service, she experiences propulsion problems due to a latent design defect and the buyers bring a warranty claim. Buyers refuse to accept delivery of the second vessel following sea trial in light of the problems with the first. Builders fail to procure a refund guarantee for the second instalment of the third vessel and buyers refuse to pay it. Builders do procure a refund guarantee for the penultimate instalment on the fourth vessel, but buyers refuse to pay that instalment. This gives rise to a huge number of issues. Uh, we're going to focus today on five main areas with a very brief discussion at the end on COVID-19 issues. So today we're going to discuss responsibility for design defects, pre and post delivery, the prevention principle, extensions of time for modifications and payment defaults, refund guarantees, termination for buyer's insolvency, and then, as I mentioned at the end, we'll bring this together with a very brief COVID thoughts from the legal angle before handing over to Demetrius for a much more in-depth analysis of the practical problems facing the community in the COVID crisis. I will now hand over to Alex, who will address you on responsibility for design defects. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, we're going to start with a, a very brief discussion of uh, responsibility for design. We'll start pre-delivery and move on to uh, the ramifications post-delivery. But I think it's, it's an important uh, concept to, to get to grips with is that the idea of responsibility for design under a shipbuilding contract is largely, I think, uh, a product of the slight identity crisis that shipbuilding contracts have always faced. Are they a contract for a sale of goods or a construction contract? And I think uh, the foreword to the latest edition of Curtis gets it absolutely right when they say that a shipbuilding contract uh, is a sale of goods contract, but with some characteristics of a building contract. So viewing this issue through that prism, you'll see that the unamended SJ form does not expressly apportion responsibility for design. Now, if a vessel contains a design fault, which causes a manifestation that is or gives rise to a breach for another provision of the contract, or in particular the technical specification, in that case, the buyer has the ability to rely on the breach of the contract or the technical specification to justify its rejection. Um, and it's not sufficient for the builder to say that is a product of the design. Now, that's all good and well where there are technical standards which a breach can be held against, be it fuel consumption or speed and performance. Um, where there is a design default that does not entail a breach of the specific requirements of the contract or the specification, 
but renders the vessel unseaworthy or unsuitable for a known purpose, it becomes more complicated. It will turn on a true construction of the contract as a whole and, and require a significant contract construction uh, exercise. Now, the preamble of the unamended SHA form, as I say, it does not include design. It's simply to build, launch, equip, and complete. But the latest edition of Curtis, I think quite rightly, says that where design risk is not expressly addressed, it should be allocated to the builder. And we know that Keating on Offshore Construction adopts the same view. I'm gonna have the next slide, please, Andrew. Now, it might be the case that the responsibility for design is implied by virtue of section 14 of the Sale of Goods Act 1979. Um, particularly the point that the goods are of satisfactory quality and fitness for purpose, which is most recently discussed in the case of neon shipping. However, there is a debate as to whether the implied terms uh, are excluded by operation of Article 9 or C, which Curtis very helpfully summarises uh, page numbers there. What is quite an interesting development is the recent Supreme Court case, uh, Robin Rigg, in which the Supreme Court held that where a builder has warranted to build the vessel to a specification, that it will be fit for a specified purpose, both obligations must be fulfilled. Uh, and the way I've termed this is that this seems to be a sort of fill the gaps approach. So where you have specific performance standards, particularly in the technical specification, where there are perhaps gaps which may still render the vessel unseaworthy or not fit for purpose, it is this Robin Rigg uh, line of thought which might fill the gaps between the specific standards and the general concepts of seaworthiness. As I say, a design fault which causes no other manifestation, for example, one which leads to a shortened lifespan of a component, but would be picked up in routine maintenance and result in more frequent replacement, is likely to be a breach of the reasonable care and skill obligations, which of course is quite rightly picks up at page 23. But best practice is very much to ensure that such discussion uh, never begins and to insert, ensure certainty, uh, amend that preamble in the contractual negotiations to expressly include design, as was the case in the famous Adyard case. However, I would note um, from experience of several occasions, is that this problem is particularly acute when you have a situation where a buyer is contracting with a builder for a construction of a standard type of vessel, uh, for example, uh, common bulk carrier designs or container ships, in circumstances where uh, a design may be imported from a third party, a, a reputable design house, et cetera, um, which naturally a builder is going to take issue with in assuming responsibility for design. On the next slide, please, Andrew. So we're now going to shift on to uh, responsibility for design defects post delivery. And normally you would go under the warranty provision, uh, which is usually for a period of 12 months found at Article 9.1. But buyers to take advantage of that warranty would have to establish that the defective design falls within um, defective material and or bad workmanship. Now, one can think of examples uh, where defective design does not fit into either of those two baskets. Um, it could be a, an issue which actually has no relation to a defective material or poor workmanship. It is in fact just bad design. And um, Curtis obviously didn't have the, uh, the benefit of, of recent, uh, most recent guidance, but I think he quite rightly says that where the builders have assumed a pre-delivery design risk, it is very likely that the warranty will extend to the obligation to remedy design defects discovered during the warranty period. And Curtis continues, it therefore seems that the builder is liable under the SAJ form, that should be an unamended SAJ form, to guarantee defects resulting from deficiencies in design. And it's our view that we discussed with some practitioners recently. The tribunals are likely to hold that the warranty covers design in the unamended SHA form for design. But we agree with Curtis that in order to avoid uncertainty on this issue, the form in practice often amended to provide so expressly and avoid having the discussion altogether. And I'll pass over to Andrew now 
who's going to take us through the recent decision in Jiangsu and pressure shipping. Thank you, Alex. I'm going to first discuss the prevention principle. As many of you will be aware, the prevention principle is a rule of English law which provides that where the buyer prevents the builder from delivering the vessel on time in a manner not provided for in the contract, then time is at large, i.e. the builder must deliver within a reasonable period of time and will not be held to the strict terms of the contract. The most recent edition of Curtis has elaborated on the prevention principle and it's well worth um, reviewing that if you have a prevention principle case. <coughs> Excuse me. The prevention principle can introduce substantial uncertainty into the contract and leave, but leaves both parties unclear as the delivery or cancellation date. Indeed, reasonableness in this context is in the eye of the beholder. What is reasonable to a builder may not be reasonable to a buyer and it's very difficult to ascertain whether one has a valid cancellation where one's dealing with a concept of reasonableness. The prevention principle is excluded where the express terms provide for an extension of time and the trend has always has been towards narrowing the application of the prevention principle. The most recent case on this um, is Jiangsu Corporation and Precious Shipping Limited, um, in which I appeared as counsel. There was a section 69 appeal from a series of interlinked shipbuilding arbitrations. This judgment um, has unfortunately been handed down immediately after the fifth edition of Curtis has gone to print. Uh, and so is not included in Curtis, but is uh, consistent with the trends discussed therein. In that case, Mr. Justice Butcher held that it was an implied term of the shipbuilding contract that neither party should actively and wrongfully, in the sense of being a breach of contract or independently wrongful, prevent the other from performing its obligations under the contract. In this case, the seller alleged that the buyer caused delay in that it failed to take delivery of earlier vessels in the series, which blocked the berth, preventing construction of later vessels. Two, they required modifications to the design. And three, they failed to pay an installment. It stated that these all caused delays, which moved the delivery date. Just pausing for a moment there, uh, and coming back to the phrase breach of contract or independently wrongful, uh, the breach of contract scenario is simple and one that we'll all be used to. The independently wrongful concept is an interesting one. In this case, the argument would be that by failing to take delivery of an earlier vessel, the buyer breached the contract in relation to that earlier vessel, which was independently wrongful from the current contract under discussion and so led to the movement of the delivery or cancellation date on the later vessel's contract. Um, and to an extent, one can, can see how that argument might work. Beyond that, however, uh, the concept of independently wrongful is not defined in the judgment, and it's unclear exactly what would be required to engage this implied term. On the facts of our case, the seller had failed to give a notice under Article 8.1 of the SAJ form and thus sought to argue that 8.1 did not apply to the blocked berths because it was argued that Article 8.1 was a force majeure clause such that it had to be beyond the control of both parties. The court rejected this argument and held at paragraph 31 that it is not called a force majeure clause. It is not, moreover, couched in terms of matters and events beyond the party's control but beyond the control of the seller or its subcontractors. It applies on its terms to any of the enumerated causes and any other causes beyond the seller's or its subcontractors control. Giving their ordinary meaning to the words used, it therefore covers matters caused by the buyer, assuming that they're outside the control of the seller or its subcontractors. This was arguably a departure from Zhushan and Golden Exquisite. But the court in Jiangsu held that what the present case has highlighted, however, is that there may be other buyer's breaches, including of the implied term of non-prevention, which cannot readily be considered as being provided for elsewhere in the contract. In light of that, I consider the best interpretation of the contract is to give their face value to the contested words of Article 8.1. Um, some of you may be aware of the Zhu Shan decision, 
Uh, but in brief, it, it involved allegations of unreasonable delay by buyer supervisor. In that case, there was an argument as to whether or not that delay was covered by Article 8.1 or was covered by Article 4. And in that circumstance, um, the court was willing to give a narrow construction to Article 8.1. In Jiangsu, by contrast, the court gave a broad construction to Article 8.1. And thus, on their face, they appear to conflict. However, I would argue that uh, Zushan is explicable by its context. In that case, you were dealing with the general provision versus the general provision, and you were dealing with whether Article 4 applied. That is quite a different context to arguing for a narrow construction of Article 8.1 to bring the prevention principle into the fray and completely throw out the party's contractual regime. And so whilst on one level, one can argue there's a, a contrast between Zhushan and Jiangsu, actually, when it comes to the breadth of the prevention principle, uh, as contrasted with Article 8.1, Jiangsu is the only authority on that point. Zhushan does not discuss the prevention principle, and it was, quite rightly, not argued. As a result of uh, Mr. Justice Butcher's conclusions, he concluded that the allegations of delay relied on were covered by Article 8.1, such that notice was required under Article 8.2. The court continued to hold that Article 8.2 would apply even if the delays relied on were outside Article 8.1 and not covered by another notification regime. Thus, this is the further nail in the coffin of the prevention principle. First, it's covered, buyer-induced delay is covered by Article 8.1, but the court has also held, even if it wasn't, you must give notice under Article 8.2. If you give notice under Article 8.2, then one is not going to be in a scenario where time is at large in the traditional prevention principle sense. Rather, the delivery date will move in accordance with the provisions of Article 8.2. Indeed, the court recognized this um, in stating that it should lean in favor of a construction that favored notification requirements. Mr. Justice Butcher gave permission to the Court of Appeal, noting this was a point of general public importance, which is likely to be heard later this year in November 2020. The court then went on to consider extension of time for modifications. Mr. Justice Butcher held that Article 5 only contemplated an extension of time where such was agreed between the parties. Without agreement on this, the seller is entitled to continue with construction to the original design and therefore cannot claim additional time if it chooses to modify the design. It is common for parties to expressly provide for extension in the case of modifications. The normal position is that, absent agreement as to the consequences, there is no obligation on the builder to do anything other than construct to the original unmodified design. Accordingly, the buyer is not entitled to extensions of time if he nevertheless builds to a modified design without agreement as to the time and cost consequences. In relation to default in payments, Mr. Justice Butcher held that there is no language which makes such an extension conditional on the service by the seller of a notice under Article 11.2. The SAJ form contained an amendment that the postponement would be at the seller's option, and the court held that this provides that the seller may choose the delivery date should be postponed. If it does not so choose, then the delivery date is not postponed. Given that both parties need to know where they stand, I consider that it is implicit that there must be communication of whether the seller has chosen that the delivery date should be postponed. In almost all cases, that choice would need to be made and communicated before the contractual delivery date. His Lordship went on to give an example where um, a post delivery date discovery may still be justified. For example, if um, the seller was insolvent prior to the delivery date, but that was only discovered post-delivery date. Um, and as he, his Lordship stated, in almost all cases, um, the choice will be made before the delivery date. The unamended SHA form does not contain this language for the postponement of the delivery date under Article 11.3, although it does for the decision to rescind under Article 11.3b, namely the at the seller's option language. Thus, if the wording at the seller's option is not included, it appears that delivery date will, on the unamended wording, extend. Will not extend, sorry. 
However, in our view, it is likely that a future tribunal would rely on Jiangsu to find that notification is nevertheless required under Article 8.2 to postpone the delivery date for non-payment. Were it otherwise, there would be uncertainty as to whether a buyer could terminate for delay. I'm now going to pass you back to Alex, who will address you on refund guarantees and buyer's insolvency. Thanks, Andrew. As all attendees are probably aware, payment under shipbuilding contracts, particularly the SAJ form, are split into milestone instalments, which are in triggered by various events which constitute part of the construction process. Common examples being contract signature, steel cutting, keel laying, launching and delivery. And those payments will be in various size percentage blocks depending on the negotiation of the market time. As most attendees will know that uh, amended SHA forms usually require a refund guarantee from a third party, uh, which is an undertaking from a bank or other surety that if a builder falls, uh, fails to refund the instalments of the contract price upon the buyer's rescission, the bank or surety will make the payment on the builder's behalf. Provision of the RGs will not usually be uh, viewed as condition precedent, uh, will usually be viewed as condition precedent to the obligation of the buyer to pay an instalment, but it is not usually a condition of the contract, nor will failure to provide such usually be regarded as a repudiatory breach. The consequences of non-provision should be sensibly spelt out in the contract, if possible, um, to avoid any confusion. If the refund guarantee is provided, the obligation to pay the instalment will normally arise regardless of any other dispute between the builder. A non-payment usually justifies the builder in terminating. Uh, just as a practitioner point that uh, we've seen a lot of recently on the refund guarantees, that unfortunately, sadly, the uh, sector has been hit heavily with various insolvencies and restructurings. Um, but it's, it's quite remarkable how often refund guarantees fail to provide significant uh, or sufficient detail in order to actually understand the parties uh, to which uh, they are to benefit. So as a practitioner point, I think uh, it's always pays to include as many details as you can about company number and registered address, etc. Can I have the next slide, please? Thanks. Turning now to termination for buyer's insolvency, which is addressed Article 11 of the Unamended SAJ form, and is concerned with non-payment of instalments and a failure to take delivery. It is common to amend the form uh, to include buyer's insolvency bankruptcy at subparagraph D of 11.1, with a requirement on the buyer to inform the builder in writing of that event of insolvency. It's common to see in that amendment very, very broad catch-all terms to cover the various terminology and regimes which are used in different jurisdictions uh, to cover scenarios where buyers have hit that insolvency bankruptcy stage. Um, another practitioner point, uh, which is we, uh, I'm sure many of us have come across many times, is that where possible, a builder should make clear which law governs the question of whether a buyer is in fact insolvent and bankrupt, which legal test is to apply, or whether that's English law which might govern the contract, or the law of the buyer's domicile, which can avoid some fairly complicated uh, conflict, uh, conflicting for sort of regimes as to, to what, con what constitutes insolvency. And where the parties provide the buyer's insolvency, bankruptcy shall provide a buyer's default, it is common to provide for an immediate right to rescind the contract at the point of formal insolvency, bankruptcy proceedings are initiated. In practice, the builder will exercise its options to terminate upon receipt of the buyer's written notice, such that proceedings have been initiated. The next slide, please, Andrew. And finally, in the event of rescission, Article 11.3b provides that one, the contract becomes null and void. Two, any buyer's supply shall become the sole property of the builder, and that's a particular issue in more complicated uh, designs of vessels. Three, the builder shall be entitled to retain any instalments paid by the builder to the buyer on account of the contract. In the event of termination, the builder has the option to complete and sell the vessel to a third party as it deems fit in accordance with Article 11.4a. And if it completes and sells the vessel, the proceeds of that sale will be allocated towards its cost of construction, sale and unpaid instalments with any surplus going to the buyer without interest. I think I now pass over to Andrew for a brief run through of recent COVID issues. Thank you, Alex. 
Uh, yeah, we're just going to touch on some of the consequences flowing from these slides uh, from a legal perspective before handing over to Dimitris, who will be able to give you a much more practical, in-depth analysis. Um, buyers and builders may experience delays during the COVID-19 crisis. For example, the builder may rely on components and materials coming from other countries that are delayed due to a shutdown of manufacturing, or indeed buyer supplied items may be affected or the buyer may be unable to send a crew to attend sea trials and take delivery. It's clear from Jiang Su that such delays fall within Article 8.1, such that the builder must give notice in accordance with Article 8.2. This requires that one, the builder gives notice within seven days of the commencement of the delay, and two, the builder advises the buyer that the delay has ended within seven days of an ending and specifies the period of time by which the delivery date is postponed by reason of the delay. In the event of a buyer's insolvency, Builders should check whether it's been included in Article 11, and if so, be sure to give notice terminating for default. If currently negotiating contracts, builders should include such provision. Equally, the inverse is true, and I've seen cases where builders' insolvency is also a, a default. It would be a seller's default under Article 11. The same consequences that Alex has discussed would apply in those circumstances as well. Moving to, just to a brief practical point as to arbitral procedure during these unusual times, um, there will be a lot more remote hearings, as I'm sure many of you will have experienced. There may be cross-examination by video link. And it may be that as lockdown eases, we enter into a more hybrid scenario where um, the council team and the lawyers potentially are in the uh, arbitral room, but witnesses and fact expert and experts and uh, clients are overseas. And this is the modified procedure that I adopted in arbitration uh, for four weeks in February, just before lockdown began. And it's entirely possible that a similar procedure will take place um, in the next months as lockdown eases. I'm now going to hand over to Dimitris, who will give you an in-depth insight into some of the practical issues being faced during the COVID-19 crisis. Over to you, Dimitris. Thank you very much, Andrew and Alex, for that very clear exposition. Now, um, we're turning next to Dimitrios Chalas, who is the fleet manager at Oceanic Services Limited and responsible for technical representation of owners in new building projects, as well as control of the technical managers for the existing fleet. Dimitrios has experience in various uh, different areas, particularly ships in service and new building projects and he's worked in many countries and in different offices throughout the world coupled with his sailing experience on board a chemical tanker and a bulk carrier most importantly perhaps for tonight's webinar is the fact that dimitrios is currently directly involved in a large new building project in korea as well as major repair projects in China under strict budget and timeline constraints. So Dimitrios is extremely well qualified to talk to us about the challenges that are presented on practical issues by the coronavirus pandemic and the crisis uh, that it inevitably produces. He's going to focus particularly on the shipbuilding industry in South Korea, but looking more generally at the position in Asia as well. Dimitrios, over to you. Thank you, Sir Richard. Uh, thank you, Alex and Andrew. Uh, first of all, uh, we would like I would like to touch upon the uh, geopolitics in the uh, Korean Peninsula. Uh, I've heard from Korean friends, they consider the, themselves an island, an island south of the 38th parallel. Uh, it is uh, quite a, an, an isolated environment, let's say. Um, the country doesn't consider to have uh, natural resources and there is minimum flatlands. Um, this creates a, a very uh, strange environment to operate in. The country relies primarily on its human resources. Uh, the main natural resource is human, actually. Uh, the, as a result of the extended uh, 
mountains uh, of the country. The shipyards are located in specific areas and they have been uh, uh, optimized in order to exploit as much of the flat land as possible. Uh, obviously near uh, riverbeds in order to allow for the dry docks to be excavated easier without extensive uh, capital expenses. Under this context, the uh, Koreans, uh, and I have to admit, uh, the, in similar pattern, the Chinese are, uh, are heavily investing in new building and uh, in repairs. Uh, this is uh, their, uh, one of their uh, strategic industries. Uh, just a brief summary of the major stages uh, that we're going to look at. Uh, the, these are different parts, yet there is significant overlapping between them. So uh, we have the commodity, which is the need for trade. We have natural resources abundant in one location. The same resource, uh, there's a demand in that location and there's a need for trade. Then uh, looking at the uh, at the details of the trade, we're looking at uh, the exact patterns that are estimated. Financing is secured, and we're looking at the different uh, uh, stage payments associated with the financing and uh, how different projects are being uh, financed. Then, as Andrew and Alex have touched upon, the uh, SAJ form the contract negotiations between the shipbuilder and the buyer. This is uh, progressing extensively closely with the specification, uh, step by step, depending the different items that are being that are necessary for the trade, for the specific pattern of the vessel, uh, for the specific charter's needs, and taking into account uh, port constraints, as well as crew requirements. And of course, the international and national legislation applicable as necessary. Then the next part is the uh, post the contract signing and the specification agreed. Uh, we're looking at the plan approvals. Uh, there is extensive plan approval going on where both classification societies and owners are helping and working in cooperation with the shipbuilder in order to optimize the design, make sure that it meets the specification and the contractual needs. Some technical milestones, such as the uh, inspection and test plan, uh, whereby we have significant involvement from the owners in this instance, as well as the classification society being allowed to work in tandem with the shipbuilder, uh, especially with the quality department of the shipbuilder, uh, in order to make sure that the design is met as per the final approved drawings. Outside the shipbuilder, though, we have the uh, manufacturers, the engine, engine builders. In this instance, uh, we see one of the main engines coupled uh, to an external hyd hydrodynamic load doing a factory acceptance test in one of the test beds of one of the major shipbuilders, sorry, uh, engine builders. And um, again, the, there's a lot of uh, interaction with the key component manufacturers, depending on the criticality of the equipment. Then we, ha we have the sea trials. Um, where we have to, to look at the uh, specific requirements. Again, uh, in the context of COVID-19, uh, as we have explained so far, there's a lot of interaction from external bodies, from uh, specialists to attend um, specific tests and inspections. Yet, during the sea trials, uh, we expect that uh, uh, the current situation uh, is affecting already uh, the pattern which is being used. Uh, we need to mention that the, the ships are designed for uh, two complements of 20, 25 uh, crew members on board. Yet during sea trials, the shipbuilder needs to deploy a lot of human resources. There are a lot of 
pending items still need to be done. Um, uh, final adjustments, commissioning, specialists. So the normal complement is doubled, tripled or quadrupled really. And uh, in practice, we have cases where we have uh, even three or four or even more people sharing one cabin, employing submarine type rotation. That is, some people are, are sleeping in the same, um, uh, in the same uh, cabin and they are sharing, they're sharing the same cabin. They are sleeping in rotation, eight hours on, eight hours off and similar patterns. Now this brings, uh, the uh, the pandemic um, really in um, in the forefront because uh, it is it is not a viable solution um, yet uh, still the shipbuilders currently are adapting and adopting to these principles they have dedicated departments um, city trial departments whereby the personnel um, are continuously optimizing the need for uh, attendees on board, as well as the um, uh, timelines that the sea are going to last for. Uh, even more demanding uh, are the gas trials when we're looking at the uh, LNG ships. Um, and in particular, the duration becomes critical. So uh, as in sea trials, same as in gas trials, the ship goes to open seas. It is a sailing ship. The shipyard has to appoint a captain, and the chief engineer uh, who will be sailing uh, the ship and demonstrating it to the buyers. And as a result, this has extensive periods of uh, testing. Um, sea trials can, be between, uh, can last between three to five days, sometimes even longer. And gas, tires, gas trials uh, can last approximately uh, the same amount, but in weeks. So we're looking at three to four weeks, sometimes longer. So we're looking at a, a, a ship with a lot of people on board for a long period of time. And the shipbuilders uh, are still at the current situation, uh, looking at uh, optimizing the need for everyone. Uh, they're scrutinizing the um, production to make sure that uh, the less commissioning uh, personnel is uh, goes on board, the better. Uh, equally, there is uh, there are discussions with owners in order to look at the absolutely necessary attendees on the buyer side. Um, on to the financial uh, milestones, uh, as uh, mentioned earlier by Andrew and Alex, the um, contract signing. The steel cutting, uh, where uh, they are not as demanding when it comes to um, interaction with, with hu humans. Um, the keel laying, where we see here one of the uh, mega blocks having been uh, laid on uh, one of the Kore major Korean yards. Launching and delivery of the ship eventually out to the open sea. Now moving uh, more into the, uh, the fine details and looking at the aspects uh, post the contract signing. Uh, plan approval uh, has transformed over the years. Uh, nowadays, the, the plan approval is conducted uh, uh, primarily, if not only electronically. There are still a few shipyards out there who do it uh, the old fashioned paper way. Yet most of the shipbuilders nowadays have, uh, secure access, give secure access to both classification societies and uh, ship owners in order to enable them to review the drawings and make comments and improvements and uh, facilitate the production process. As this progresses and technology is on our side, we can see more and more um, remote operations so that we don't see any effects on the COVID uh, because of the COVID-19. Uh, when it comes to uh, hazard and hazard operations, uh, hazard identification uh, with specific uh, 
requirements. Again, these discussions are better conducted in, in a meeting, face-to-face, uh, -face, first with personal uh, contacts, yet uh, these are being uh, conducted in a virtual environment as well. Uh, when it comes to raw material, um, the material itself it, uh, it is, is not an issue. The, as, uh, as it has been mentioned earlier correctly, the production of the material and the supply of the material might be uh, affected. Uh, yet the shipbuilders are doing uh, everything they can and the maker and the equipment and component makers in order to uh, secure the uh, production. Um, these are long contracts. Um, they have very tight control of the raw material and the equipment manufacturers and they, they are continuously um, monitoring the progress and making sure that the deadlines are met. This might have an effect especially on um, components which have been affected by coronavirus. For example, we have had cases where uh, some of the more delicate measuring meters have used equipment same as the equipment being used in um, in equipment uh, that um, identifies the virus in laboratories etc and thus there has been a, a demand for these components which has starved the market um, but uh, not, that's narrowed down into the flow meters in reality so but these these are items that are small and not extensively um, used and would not affect um, building of a ship nor its equipment components. So all these equipment are um, neutral, as we, uh, as we would say, and there is uh, normal interaction. Then we have the mega blocks. We have uh, shipbuilders that uh, are located in one location, yet they are subcontracting large blocks which are being shifted from one place to the other with huge cranes, barges that arrive to the ship, shipyard and eventually um, float. With regards to the key stages, again, uh, when it comes to um, uh, the important uh, stage payments for the shipbuilders, uh, we see no problem at all. Um, the, the shipyards have measures in place to allow them to happen without uh, any um, difficulty. Measures have been taken, um, preventative measures, but um, other than that, um, there is no, uh, uh, no big delays or uh, no showstoppers. Uh, in more detail, with regards to the inspections, again, the, there is human contact there. We have quality control, we have the owners, representatives and specialists, yet um, the shipyards and uh, all over the world are making provisions to allow for um, specialists to attend to examine. Um, with regards to the um, components commissioning, again, we have some specialists, we have special equipment and uh, material, uh, quality procedures, that need to be followed. Everything is being um, uh, recorded uh, carefully and distances can be kept. The uh, specifications can be checked and uh, uh, especially um, during gas trials, I mentioned there's, uh, the environment is, uh, is quite demanding, yet the shipyards uh, can and are already looking at alternatives such as um, signing people off from the middle of the sea. So after a few weeks out in the open seas, they send a launch to pick up um, personnel or um, drop them off. Um, finally, um, I would like to uh, point out that both China and Korea have um, made currently provision for key specialized personnel to be allowed entry. So. As whenever um, there, is a, there is an actual need for uh, specialized knowledge, which doesn't exist uh, within the country, then uh, special visas can be arranged. Especially Korea allows even uh, non-specialized personnel to enter, subject to quarantine. We've seen people um, staying in hotels for approximately 14 days, 
that is the current situation, of course. Uh, personnel uh, is um, confined to absolutely necessary interactions. So as we see, some of the opening meetings are being held out and uh, precautions are being taken. The domestic professionals, they are going through um, significant uh, quarantine checks continuously and they have um, uh, they are not subject to any additional requirements other than the, the ones of the um, country. Uh, yet, uh, all over the shipyards, we see people uh, wearing their protective equipment and being conscious that um, uh, a single spread could incapacitate the shipyard, which is totally unacceptable. Uh, even the canteens, it would, it would worth mentioning, and this is a, a picture of one of the canteens. They have been modified and uh, we see uh, workers and uh, employees uh, eating in suitable style arrangements to make sure the spread, that, that there is no spread. And uh, there is significant screening and continuous monitoring of professionals and workers um, in order to make sure that uh, any single event is identified and uh, eliminated as soon as possible. Um, thank you very much again and uh, passing on to Sir Richard. Dimitrios, thank you uh, very much indeed for that uh, magnificent survey. Those last photographs were particularly impressive, I thought and they show what uh, enormous lengths uh, the professionals in Korea are going to to ensure that their industries can carry on despite the very difficult conditions that there are. And uh, one, one wonders whether the same is being done in industries, not necessarily shipbuilding, in this country. Well, I was rather hoping that by the time, uh, Dimitrios, that you had finished, we would have had some questions from uh, our attendees this evening, some difficult questions to put to our panelists, um, but we haven't so far, uh, I'm afraid, got any questions, but of course, something may arise uh, very quickly. So, I wondered uh, whether or not I could start some discussion going uh, in relation to contractual issues to start with. And I was uh, interested in um, an, a number of uh, matters. Um, and let, let me take one in relation to refund uh, guarantees. Uh, which must be quite an important issue in the current situation, I would have thought. And it, it does um, occur to me that the statement, um, which is the, the accepted law, uh, that a failure to provide a refund guarantee is not necessarily repudiatory of the contract, uh, might be something which uh, should be questioned in the current light. Uh, because uh, I would have thought that um, the uh, provision of those is something which is uh, really quite vital in the current circumstances to ensure that there is going to be confidence in the whole process moving ahead. Um, I, I'm sure that all three of you have got um, thoughts on that. Um, Dimitrios, you're, you're still on the screen, so perhaps we start with, with you. Do you how, how important in practice is this, and what are the consequences if they're not provided in the current circumstances? Uh, specifically with regards to um, refund, refund guarantees, um, it is uh, very important um, that all the parties uh, have clarity. Um, Alex uh, mentioned it correctly that background checks uh, need to be done. And uh, I think it is vital that uh, the, uh, all the parties uh, are um, solid and uh, that there is full traceability 
in order to be able to ensure that uh, the uh, everybody's obligations are met um, in in case of default. But um, uh, Sir Richard, if you allow me to pass on to Alex, uh, who would uh, be cool. yeah, I, I I meant just to start with you because you're on uh, on the screen in front of me. Uh, but I gather that all the attendees can see everyone anyway. So yes. Let, let, let's pass on to Alex and Andrew. Who's going to go first? I think I'll jump in there, Sir Richard, if that's okay. I, I think Dimitri was absolutely right. I think we're, we're in a position at the moment now with considerable market uncertainty. Um, and you know, we're fielding queries on, on these sorts of points on an almost daily basis now because people simply aren't sure uh, what the financial positions are of their counterparties, be it builder or buyer. So I think it's absolutely right that there should be certainty. Um, and if you can, as a matter of negotiation and contract, make it a condition that the RGs are provided. I think that's absolutely critical to ensure that you are protected for, particularly on some of these uh, larger and, and more interesting projects, we're looking at very, very serious amounts of money. So I think uh, there has to be that contractual uh, protection in place and, and uh, properly drafted, the refund guarantee does provide that protection. Yeah. What, 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 what about uh, past contracts where you may not have had that, uh, that degree of certainty, that degree of clarity? Do you, do you, do you think, Andrew, that there's a, a possibility of challenging the, the generally accepted rule that non-provision is not necessarily repudiatory? Or is that an uphill task? Um, yeah, it's a difficult question, but if we bear in mind the fact that the refund guarantee is a precondition to a payment obligation on the buyer, then the non-provision of the refund guarantee is only prejudicing the builder, namely that they will no longer receive their payment. And as I understand, the rationale of the current position is that if the builder is in financial difficulties and therefore unable to get a refund guarantee from a bank, that shouldn't prevent them from continuing to build the vessel, which is their primary obligation, delivering the vessel within time and then um, fulfilling the preconditions to their payment rights. And so one can see how if one party is not performing its obligation to provide refund guarantees, you would suspect, aha, we have a breach. And if they say, I'm never gonna provide a refund guarantee, you may say, ah, well, it's an intention to no longer be bound by the contract. But if we bear in mind the primary obligation to build the ship and deliver it within time, as long as that's not disadvantaged, then really the, um, there's no reason why the buyer would, would object. I mean, they're being relieved of their payment obligations in the meantime. And so um, I, I can understand why the rule is that it's not necessarily a reputed breach. But of course, with all of these things, it will be fact dependent and it depends on what other breaches are occurring and, and how the builder is performing its building obligations. Um, but I don't know if Alex has any further points to add on that. Yeah, I, th I think it's an interesting point, actually, and I, and I think this comes back to what the the over what I took from my from the reading of the recent Jiangsu pressure shipping cases. And I think uh, Butcher's judgment was really uh, a very sensible and very pragmatic approach, which the tribunal had taken in the first instance. And it's really communication is the key between the parties. And in circumstances where there might be difficulties in securing refund guarantees, be it because of difficulties at the financial institution themselves or with the builder, or even if it's the buyer who, who has an issue with making payment, what's quite clear from the Jiangsu pressure shipping case is that communication between the parties is absolutely critical. And for certain parts of the SAJ form, that means a formal notice regime, for example, under Article 82. Uh, but also, uh, you'll see that Butcher actually takes the view that actually informal notification between the parties um, has its place as well. So I think I think communication between the parties at this time is is also important if a dispute is to be avoided. Thank you. Now we we have a question from one of the attendees from Dimitris Monudis. Uh, and uh, it reads, in view of the unprecedented, inverted commas, pandemic experience, what new, previously not considered, additional clauses to the SAJ would you suggest that buyers and builders should attempt to include during negotiations? Well, um, 
Andrew, would would you like to uh, kick off with with thoughts on that, and and then um, I'm sure both Alex and Dimitrios have got some further thoughts as well. Thank you, Sir Richard. Um, uh, it's a good question. Uh, obviously, uh, Dimitrios has asked previously, not considered, but I think it would be remiss not to say that, in my view, a key additional clause not in the unamended SAJ form is to include buyer's default and seller's default for insolvency. Um, Demetrius has uh, provided a fantastic overview of how um, companies are, are keeping going, but it's uh, no secret, I think, that the global economy is suffering and supply chains are going to be difficult and demand may change. So that's an important additional clause that I would always include. Uh, beyond that, you might want to make express provision for delays due to pandemics in Article 8.1. So the Jiangsu judgment is, is useful in giving that an expansive reading, but if you want to be absolutely sure not to have the prevention principle laying in the background, I would consider adding that expressly into, into Article 8.1 to make sure that that's covered. Um, Alex, do you have any other thoughts on that? No, I'd agree with that entirely, Andrew. I mean, what I would say in terms of the detailed drafting point, a lot of the inquiries that we've had to deal with um, over the last three months uh, have been a sort of fairly forensic analysis of, of what constitutes force majeure and then delving into um, various clauses which may have included epidemic, pandemic, act of God, etc. I, I think what's quite important is to just uh, drill down into the impact of what this pandemic has had. I think for parties who are considering entering into commercial contracts, uh, quite possibly for, for a very long time going forward as successive waves um, and as the pandemic is managed by different countries in different ways, um, I think it's quite important that parties consider exactly how um, the wording of the, the force majeure aspects or the, uh, the delay aspects under Article 8.1 are handled because in our experience and from recent inquiries we've had uh, very very different permutations of, of the pandemic be it supply of crew or components or uh, the acts of uh, national or state governments so i think i think in terms of entering into a contract right now i would think very very hard and, and give some some thought as to the permutations of, of any such delay or force majeure provision Okay, now, um, uh, Dimitrios, if you don't mind, we've got another question. So I, I'm going to um, put that question to the panel uh, and um, see what you think. This is an anonymous attendee who asks, would unilateral sanctions, travel restrictions by certain countries, for example, the United States, the United Kingdom, etc., for travelers dealing with sea trials, delivery, etc., to say China, due to trade wars, be considered as a justified cause of delay. So, not necessarily to do with the current pandemic, but trade wars. But obviously, it is it, the, the question has, has relevance in relation to the pandemic as well. Well, um, uh, what, what do you think about that then, Alex? Um, well, I think, well, first and foremost, it depends what your contract says. But if you look at, I'm looking That's at the, uh, the unamended, uh, the unamended SAJ form 8.1, which says intervention of government authority. Um, I think this is quite interesting because um, I, I appreciate the, the questions in the context of perhaps a trade war, or perhaps political tensions between parties. Um, but but that this also permeates into the pandemic because certain countries have uh, taken very different views and very different approaches. And yeah. the government restrictions have taken very different forms. And it's been our, it's been some of the inquiries we've dealt with have been actually the country in which the vessel is being built may not have that much in the way of uh, restriction. But the uh, country from which the contractor or the supplier or the buyer is, is based has a very different scenario indeed. So I think it's the same situation. It's this, uh, to what extent does the intervention of government authorities, with, be it in the place where the vessel is being built or where the key personnel uh, are based? And I think depending on what your contract says, there is, there is an argument for that. Yeah. Uh, Dimitrios, in, in practice, is this something that you've come across in relation to trade wars as well as the 
the, the pandemic crisis? Uh, we we have seen indeed, uh, Sir Richard, the uh, difficulty in traveling. We have had uh, big projects uh, in Asia ourselves, and uh, it is a strange situation whereby uh, it is uh, not necessarily uh, the recipient country, but uh, our own country that uh, doesn't uh, allow or facilitate uh, traveling, uh, or there might be the personnel uh, returning home, um, and generally uh, what the uh, the way the way that uh, we can deal with that, and uh, we're trying to find a local resource. As much as we would all, um, prefer to have um, our own resources appointed, um, the, what we're trying to do is uh, uh, have agents in place, try to circumvent the difficulties. Uh, we're using uh, remote tools to keep on monitoring and controlling the situation as much as we can in order to facilitate that and make sure that the projects are delivered in, on time and in budget. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, we have another question, uh, also from an anonymous attendee. Defects are to be discovered within a period of 12 months after the date of delivery. Is there any possibility to make a notice of claim after that period? What about other shipbuilding contracts, by which I think the uh, questioner probably means standard forms of contracts, uh, other than the one we're particularly discussing? Well, I'm going to pitch that one at Andrew, I think, to start with. Uh, thank you, Sir Richard. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right that under the SAJ form, the warranty period is 12 months. But of course, um, it's entirely possible to amend that uh, to whatever uh, the point is like. My understanding is that throughout um, the Far East, 12 months is a fairly standard period. Um, I'm not personally as familiar with the position under other um, forms, so I will possibly leave that to Alex. But yeah, the possibility is absolutely there. Uh, and just while we're uh, discussing the warranty, one point to note again that Alex touched on earlier is the Effective materials and or poor workmanship wording. Um, if you have a doubt at the point of taking delivery, uh, you are better to reject the vessel than you are to take delivery and seek to bring an action under the warranty because the warranty wording tends to be regarded as a much narrower uh, scope because it deals only with poor workmanship and uh, defective materials. And if you are a buyer, you're best to negotiate as long as warranty period as possible to give yourself maximum coverage. But I'll pass to Alex if he has any comments on other uh, shipbuilding forms. Like you, Andrew, I think most of my experience of recent years is SAJ based. I mean, what I would say in terms of sort of latent uh, defects, I think as Andrew has rightly said, if there is any concern at the time uh, that, that, uh, that uh, the vessel is delivered, a buyer needs to think very carefully about how they, they take delivery and, and in what form. And I think it also draws to it, uh, the attention to the need for buyers, even during these rather difficult times, to ensure attendance, uh, either virtual or physical, at the key moments, be it the shop tests, sea trials um, and other milestones, to ensure that they know what they're getting. I think um, the, the, the panelist probably contemplates uh, a situation where there is a, a defect that is discovered, but then there's a delay in bringing the claim and how to get around the fact that it's uh, an attempt to do that after the 12 month period. They raise some difficult issues of, of law um, and perhaps <coughs> more complicated than we can go into at the moment. But the, I have one, uh, one further question uh, that's arrived and it's extremely topical uh, because it concerns cruise ships uh, and we've all seen what's happened with cruise ships uh, during the course of the, of the pandemic. So the question is, has any of the panelists yet seen any changes to specifications of cruise ships under construction anticipating changes in requirements to enable safe cruising in the, quotes, new normal, close quotes. Is this likely to cause major difficulties for builders and owners? 
Well, Dimitrios, perhaps you're the first person to, to have a, a crack at this. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, thank you, Sir Richard. Um, uh, I have to admit that uh, my uh, experience on cruise ships is limited. Um, cruise ships, uh, it, it is a niche, it is a specialized market. Uh, it is uh, highly driven by um, uh, psychological effects of, uh, of human, human beings. Um, we can all be sitting and uh, discussing uh, significantly about the effects of coronavirus. But uh, we have to bring ourselves to uh, consider whether we would be willing to board a ship with uh, 1,000 or 2,000 more uh, other people, uh, relatively confined and, and, uh, and controlled. Uh, I know from uh, professionals and colleagues in the industry that the uh, uh, cruise industry is looking at the, the existing model actively. Um, they, uh, they are looking at reassurances to uh, the public to make sure that uh, the, the public's um, uh, opinion is addressed and that uh, their fears are addressed, really. So I wouldn't be surprised if we first start seeing um, modifications or alterations in the capacity of the, of the lines or uh, in the way that they're operating, and then subsequently these learning points being passed on to the building contract. So um, to answer, um, Mr. Darius uh, Godzik uh, question, I would, uh, I would point out that uh, the lessons learned from the actual operators uh, would then be implemented and entered into the specification for the new building arena. I think the shipbuilders are not the right, uh, the right uh, uh, pool uh, at this stage. Although there's significant knowledge and practical knowledge out there, uh, there are going to be practical lessons learned from the new reality. Yes. Yes, I'm sure. Have, have you had any anything that's come to your note, to Alex, on this? Yeah, not uh, specifically cruise ships, but passenger ferries. We have had discussions for passenger ferries that are currently under construction and looking uh, to possible modifications. But naturally, no one is quite sure how long this situation is going to persist. So people are reluctant to commit to more permanent modifications if indeed this is a, a sort of social distancing is something which is only going to last for a short period. But, but on that, I suppose that just goes back to the, the point that's covered in Jiangsu, mm -hmm. that where there is uh, modification, then of course the extension of time protocol must be followed under the contract with appropriate notification between the parties to ensure that delivery dates are moved. Well, talking as somebody who uses uh, passenger ferries uh, regularly or did so up until March, um, I think I would be very keen to know what modifications are <laughs> coming along in the future, uh, because uh, I think I'm more naturally um, a bit cautious uh, to to continue using them uh, if there are not modifications. But there we are. We'll, we'll see. Now, um, there aren't any more questions that have come up from attendees at the minute, but mm. I just wanted to to throw one in, one last one in, perhaps. Uh, to, to round things off. Uh, and that is really on the question of uh, insolvency. Uh, as as um, panelists have pointed out, insolvency is something that can arise either on the, the builder's side or on the buyer's side. Uh, and uh, as has uh, been pointed out frequently, that the question of, of by which law you decide whether there has been an insolvency on one on one party or the other is not explicit, uh, and the the advice is that uh, this should be dealt with expressly in the contract terms. <coughs> I just just wondering whether or not it is um, how you deal with this if it's not not um, express. Would the implied term be that it would be uh, insolvency according to the domicile of the relevant party? In other words, if it's the if it's the the buyer, then the the buyer's domicile. If it's the shipbuilder, the shipbuilder's domicile. And how how likely is it that uh, one or other party, if not domiciled in the UK, but the contract is governed by UK law, would be comfortable? with saying uh, insolvency is to be judged by the relevant UK legislation definitions. I don't, I don't know whether this is something that's turned up in practice, 
uh, but um, I, I pose the question because it's, it strikes me as an interesting one as somebody who's interested in the conflicts of laws. Andrew, Alex, have you got any experience of, of Um, thank you, Sir Richard. It's a, it's a very difficult question. Um, my initial reaction would be to say that we're dealing here with a contractual obligation, and it's a contractual obligation uh, contained in an English law governed contract. And in those circumstances, it would be unusual, although not impossible, for that obligation to be governed by a non English law, and it, it could be something else. But I think in the absence of choice, you would fall back just on, on the usual Rome 1, Article 4 provisions, and this would be a, a sale of goods, and it would be government or if you've got the extra choice um, with Article 3. But it, it is tricky. I, I suspect that um, a tribunal would, would lean more in favour of English law for that question because it has been selected by the parties. Um, but equally, one can see the argument that if you're dealing, for example, with a seller's insolvency based in, in China, they would say, well, of course, we're dealing with my insolvency and where I'm domiciled should reign supreme. But I think as a matter of conflicts, English law, Rome too would point towards English law. Okay. Um, now there's, there is a, a follow-up uh, question from the, the person who asked about the, uh, the possibility of making a notice of claim after the 12-month period uh, for defects. Uh, the, the further question uh, asked exactly how to get around the delay in discovering the defect, uh, a, a, a defect being latent, uh, and so not discoverable within the 12 month period. Does the period of 12 months extend to the statutory implied terms as to quality? That begs a number of questions, I suppose. Yeah, I'll just jump in briefly on the second question. Um, under the SAJ form, uh, it is thought that the warranty excludes the implied terms as to quality. So once you receive delivery of the vessel, you no longer can rely on the implied terms. Uh, and they're, they're gone completely. It, it's thought to replace those with the specific warranty. Um, as to the first question, I suppose the problem is there is no way to get around the delay. Uh, the 12 month warranty is intended to cover latent defects. And if the defect is patent at the point of delivery, you would reject the vessel. Um, and the 12 month period is supposed to provide that little bit of extra protection if something should arise. Unfortunately, if something arises in month 13, in my experience, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get around the 12 month period and seek to somehow extend the warranty. Um, but I don't know if, if Alex or Demetrius has any other thoughts. Yeah, no, I agree, I agree with that completely, Andrew. I think um, in circumstances, uh, I have in mind a situation where uh, there's a series of vessels, um, common uh, builders and buyers. Um, you could see a situation where maybe there might be issues with certain vessels which perhaps don't manifest themselves in others in the series. And you're quite right. I think beyond month 13, it all gets very difficult. But as I mentioned earlier, if you have a situation where you have a series of vessels and some present with uh, diff uh, design issues or workmanship issues, then a buyer should think very carefully about on what terms they accept delivery and whether in fact they want to revisit the warranty period. Um, but, it, but it doesn't seem right to me, uh, depending on what your contract says, that a builder is somehow on the hook for the possibility uh, that you know, 24 years and 11 months, assuming a sort of useful commercial life for 25 years, that uh, a latent defect that would somehow pops up, which leads to uh, a major issue, they would somehow be, uh, that's not exactly the, the, the contractual bargain which they have struck. Okay, well, thank you very much. And there, there is one further question. If there's a short answer to it, then let's have it. I suspect actually it's quite a difficult issue 
And the, the question is, if the buyer wrongfully rejects the vessel due to defects, i.e. there aren't any defects which would give a right to reject, what are the measure, what, are the measure, what is the measure of damages uh, that the shipbuilder can claim on the basis of a wrongful repudiation uh, of the contract, I assume? Um, easy or difficult, Andrew? Um, I can give you the short answer, uh, which is that generally the measure of damages will be the loss of profits. So if the value of the vessel has gone up, then generally the builder will not have suffered any loss. And if now the market value of the vessel is much lower, then he'll be able to claim for the difference between selling the vessel at, at the market now and what the contract price was worth. But that's quite a broad brush analysis and it's very fact specific and there'll be all sorts of other bits and pieces and consequential loss, etc. that yeah. Much, much longer answer. Well, there, there, there could be, and, and of course, the situation is likely to arise only when the market has gone down, uh, I suspect. Um, and it's where, where buy, buyers are trying to get out of a, a contract because they, it's no longer going to be profitable to, to, uh, to, to trade the ship. But I think we should draw a line there uh, because um, we, we've had a lot of questions and a lot of very interesting discussion. And uh, I, for my part, would like to thank the three panelists uh, for the way that they have dealt so fully with all the questions, as well as for their very clear presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Ian, over thank to you. you. Thank you, Mr. Richard. Um, can I just add my thanks on behalf of the London Shipping Law Centre to you as chairman and uh, so to, uh, to our panelists and for their uh, assistance in organising this uh, seminar which has raised some very interesting points many of which have been the subject of London arbitrations in the last uh, in the last 10 years. Um, can I uh, finally announce that the fourth of the current series of uh, London Shipping Law Centre webinars uh, online will take place on the 30th of July and will be on the subject of data at a distance, mm -hmm. the art of remote inspections and so I hope that uh, all of you for participating will sign up for this and the details will be circulated shortly. So thank you all and we'll now uh, conclude the meeting. Thank you.